9-11, the day that 2,823 people died and more than 6,000 were injured in the worst terror attack to have ever taken place. While there are 105 victims of the terror attack who are still classified as missing people, there is another person in New York City who went missing on that fateful day. Although she is not amongst the victims of Al-Qaeda, she is still a victim and her story deserves to be told. Let's uncover the disappearance of Michelle Harris. Hello and welcome to the third episode of Uncover True Crime Podcast. My name is Stephanie and each week we uncover a different unsolved true crime case ranging from unsolved disappearances, unsolved murders, Jane and John Doe cases and suspicious deaths. You can follow the podcast on Twitter at uncover underscore pod and on Instagram at uncover true crime pod. You can listen to the podcast on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, Castbox and other podcast streaming apps. Without any further ado, let's uncover the disappearance of Michelle Harris. Michelle, also known as Shelley to close friends and family, was born on the 29th of September 1965 to an average working class family. She would meet her future husband, Cal Harris, when she took a job working as a secretary at one of the car dealerships his family owned. Cal was 27 when they met and was already a successful businessman. He would later go on to own numerous car dealerships in Cortland, New York, and by 2001 he was estimated to be worth around 4 to $5 million. Cal and Michelle bought a 252-acre estate on Hagedorn Road in Owego, New York. By 2001, the couple had four young children aged between two and seven, Kayla, Taylor, Jenna and Tanner. And as picturesque and perfect as this might all sound, by September 2001, the marriage has fallen apart and Cal and Michelle were in the middle of a divorce. During their separation, Cal and Michelle decided to continue living under the same roof and Michelle began dating a man called Brian Early. Brian was very invested in their future as he had moved to be closer to Michelle and even gave her money to put towards the house that they could buy together when the divorce was final. Brian wanted to marry Michelle but apparently Michelle didn't feel the same way and wanted more time. Understandably, she didn't want to leave one marriage just to jump into another. It was perhaps due to this mounting pressure that she secretly began a relationship with one of her co-workers from Lefty's Bar, Michael Casper. She didn't even tell her best friend about this relationship and sadly, she and everyone else that Michelle knew found out about it when she went missing on the 11th of September 2001, age 35. On the day of her disappearance, she worked a shift at her job at Lefty's. When her shift ended, she had a drink with Michael Casper and his friend Michael Hakes. She left at 9.30pm and visited her boyfriend Brian. He said that she left his home at 11.30pm to make her way back home. It appears as though she made it home as her vehicle, a gold 2000 Ford Windstar van, was found the next day at the end of the drive with the keys still in the ignition. When she was last seen, she was wearing khaki shorts, white sneakers, a gold and silver Rolex watch, numerous rings, bracelets and earrings, two chain necklaces, one of which had a religious pendant on it, and a blue polo shirt. The polo shirt was part of her work uniform at Lefties and had red and white stripes on it, along with the Lefties logo and a white star imprinted on the front. When her friend Nicole Burdett came over to Michelle and Cal's house to see her the next day, she was shocked to find out that Michelle hadn't returned home the previous night. Cal didn't appear concerned and since he was aware of the relationship between Michelle and Brian, he assumed she'd stayed at his house and appeared calm throughout the day. Nicole wasn't convinced saying she would never stay out overnight on a whim as she had four kids at home. She called Michelle's divorce lawyer, who reported her missing that day. Their nanny was in the house at the time and informed Cal that Michelle's van was at the bottom of the drive. She claims that he said, quote, well, we better go get it, unquote, and immediately drove it up the drive. This would later strike people as odd, as the nanny didn't mention to Cal that the keys were in the van. How did he expect to drive the van up the driveway unless he knew the keys were in there? When the police arrived at the home later that day to investigate the missing persons report, Cal consented to them searching the home for any clues to where she might be. They found drops of blood in the garage and the kitchen, and from that moment on, 
Cal was their prime suspect. Police set their sights on Cal and even put a tracking device in his car, hoping he would lead them to where he dumped her body, but this didn't turn up any new leads. He would eventually be charged with her murder in 2005 and the trial began in 2007. Dr Henry Lee, one of the forensic scientists who testified in the OJ trial, took the stand in Cal's trial and said that the blood found in the house had come from a source 29 inches from the floor, although the spatter could have been caused by someone shaking their finger after cutting themselves. He couldn't prove that the blood was hers and it easily could have come from one of the children. The blood also didn't prove fatal injury and there was no way to determine how old the blood was. The prosecution claimed that there was evidence that someone had tried to clean up the blood, although this doesn't seem odd to me as most people would clean up their blood if they cut themselves. Michelle's hairdresser testified that in July 2001, just months before she went missing, Michelle received a call from Cal while she was at the hairdresser's and the woman heard Cal saying to her, quote, I will fucking kill you. I will make you disappear, unquote. While Cal didn't deny saying this to Michelle, he claimed to have said it in the heat of the moment and didn't mean it as a threat. Despite the prosecution not being able to prove how he had supposedly killed her or managed to hide her body so well with four kids in tow, he was found guilty of her murder. Just a mere 24 hours after the verdict was read, a man called Kevin Tubbs came forward and told authorities that he had seen someone matching Michelle's description outside her home between 5.30am and 6am on the 12th of September 2001. Kevin was a neighbour and was pretty positive that the woman he saw was Michelle and that the man he had seen arguing with her was not Cal. He was shown a photo of a man called Stacy Stewart and he confirmed that that was indeed the man he saw. Stacy Stewart was a regular at Lefties and moved to Texas right after Michelle went missing. It is unknown why Kevin didn't come forward earlier with this information, but in light of his statement, Cal's conviction was overturned five months later and a new trial was ordered. Despite the defence having a new eyewitness, Cal would again be found guilty of murder. This time, it would be four years before the verdict would be overturned due to a couple of issues with the jury. One of the jurors came forward and claimed that she had already made her mind up about Cal being guilty before the trial, therefore she wasn't impartial, and it was also discovered that the jury had not received adequate instructions on the weight of hearsay testimony. Due to the high amount of publicity the first two trials had garnered, the third took place in Shehere County, New York. Kevin again testified that he saw Michelle arguing with Stacey Stewart between 5.30 and 6am on the 12th of September but the prosecution argued that he couldn't possibly have known that as he was too far away to say with 100% certainty who he saw. However, the judge ruled that the defence could not present theories of other suspects to the jury as he claimed it was only circumstantial evidence pointing to other suspects. After 11 days of deliberations, the jury announced that they were hopelessly deadlocked and the judge declared a mistrial. The DA's office were so convinced of his guilt that they ordered a fourth trial to commence, 10 years after his first one began. This time, he waived a jury trial and opted for a bench trial, meaning that the judge would alone decide his fate. Statistically, judges tend to find defendants guilty more often than not, so it was a risky move. The new judge allowed the defence to introduce evidence implicating other possible suspects, and they presented burnt pieces of fabric found in a fire pit on a property that used to be owned by Stacey Stewart. The fabric was said to be consistent with the shirt that Michelle had been wearing when she was last seen. They also found a knife, a button, and what was possibly a bra strap burnt in the pit. They claimed that Stacey Stewart and his friend Christopher Thompson were regulars at the bar where Michelle worked and that she had met them for drinks after leaving Brian's house. A witness claimed that they had not only seen the men burn bloody clothing the day after she disappeared, but that the men told him that Michelle was buried in concrete. 
Christopher's ex-wife also testified that he made a similar comment to her. Although this comment would later be stricken from the record, Stacey's ex-girlfriend Julie Brickman claimed that Stacey told her that he was the last person to see someone before they went missing and he knew how to hide a body. The reason this comment was stricken was because Julie admitted that Stacey never explicitly said he was talking about Michelle. Another ex-girlfriend of Stacey's claimed that the reason he moved to Texas so soon after Michelle's disappearance was because of police questioning him about Michelle. The judge found Cal not guilty and as a result, he is not able to be tried again for her murder due to double jeopardy. Let's talk about other possible suspects, although before we even get into this, I really want to emphasise that this is all speculation and that everybody is innocent until proven guilty. We've already discussed Stacey and Christopher, so let's talk about people a little bit closer to home. Brian Earley admitted to being the last person to see Michelle that night, yet his car and house was never searched. It's possible that Michelle broke off their relationship that night, or that he found out about her relationship with Michael Caspar, or perhaps said that she didn't want to marry him right after her divorce was finalised. Remember that man that Michelle and Michael Caspar were drinking with before she went to Brian's, Michael Hakes? Well, he is a convicted rapist. He could have followed her home after leaving Brian's house, tried to attack her, killed her, and then disposed of her body. The home of Michael Caspar was also never searched, and all three of these men were cleared by police purely off the basis of a lie detector test. In my opinion, lie detector tests should only ever be used as an investigative tool and should never be used to either rule someone out as a suspect or to convict them. There are so many factors that can alter the result of a lie detector test and there is a very good reason why they're not allowed to be used as evidence in court. As far as I could see, there's been no further developments on Michelle Harris's case since Kel was acquitted and her case remains unsolved. Unfortunately, the conclusion of the fourth trial would not be the end of Kel's legal troubles. He was convicted of second degree menacing and a second degree harassment violation. The victim was an NYPD officer called Terry Schwartz who was part of the team who investigated Michelle's disappearance and also served as a witness during his fourth murder trial. Harris allegedly was standing outside Terry's home and said quote, I'm going to get all you guys. How's your son? Maybe I'll go drag him out of school. I have been following him around. Unquote. He also videoed the outside of Terry's home and the footage was found on the dash cam of Harris's car. Harris said that the charges were, quote, a feeble attempt to get even, unquote. He said that he was in the area to sell a drone that he'd advertised online, but the address he was given for the sale of the drone was incorrect. He said that Terry provoked him and asked him where he buried his wife's body. An order of protection was served for the detective and Cal was forced to surrender all his guns. He lost his home and all of his businesses as a result of his four trials and would later sue his former business partner, Joseph Reagan, so he could have them back. In the lawsuit, Cal is requesting either 40% share of the dealership's back or $12.5 million in damages. I was unable to find the result of this lawsuit. He also filed a suit against the Diego DA and the NYPD, but I couldn't find the result of that either. During an interview regarding the lawsuit, Cal said, quote, They're enjoying every moment of going after me. It was sport to them. It was entertainment for them. End quote. Michelle and Cal's four children, who are now all adults, all believe in their father's innocence and are still hoping to one day find out what happened to their mother. Their daughter Kayla said, quote, Everyone always says that her smile would light up a room, end quote. Kayla Harris commented, quote, I try to be the person she would want me to be, end quote. Cal said that he has been, quote, robbed of his right to be a father and he cried while stating, quote, I've been ripped away from my kids three times now. It's been hard. We won't have any closure till we find Michelle. Not until we find the mother of my children and get those answers. Not until we find the mother of my children and we get those answers, there won't be closure. And we should have those answers. This isn't a mystery. It just wasn't handled properly." End quote. Michelle's case is still open. She was 5 foot 2 and weighed 100 pounds when she went missing on the 11th of September 2001. She had blonde hair, brown eyes 
and had a tattoo of a flaming sun on her right ankle. She had previously had a breast augmentation and her ears were pierced. Michelle has been known to use the last name Taylor and her nickname was Shelley. If alive today, she would be 55 years old. She was last seen wearing khaki shorts, white sneakers, a gold and silver Rolex watch, numerous rings, bracelets and earrings, two chain necklaces, one of which had a religious pendant on it, and a navy blue polo shirt, which was her work uniform from lefties. The shirt had a collar, red and white stripes, the lefties logo, and a white star imprinted on the front. If you have any information on the circumstances of Michelle Harris's disappearance, please contact the NYPD's Missing Persons Department at 212-694-7782. Unfortunately, it is likely that Michelle is now deceased, but I hope one day her family will get the answers that they sorely deserve. I know that a lot of people listening to this will probably think that Cal is indeed responsible for Michelle's death, and to an extent I understand that, but I think we do have to respect the fact that he has been through four trials and was ultimately acquitted of all charges. I think that there's numerous other suspects that they could have looked at other than Cal, and although I understand Cal being a suspect, there are plenty other people that we have discussed in this case that I think may have had something to do with Michelle's disappearance. And even if you do believe that Cal is responsible for her death, that doesn't mean that her case doesn't still deserve exposure. Her body has never been found, and if she is ever discovered, this could go a long way into, into conclusively determining who took her life. Michelle was only 35 years old and had four young children. She had the rest of her life ahead of her and her future was cruelly taken away. That's why I chose to cover this case. All sources and photos relating to this case can be found at www.uncoveredtruecrimepodcast.blogspot.com Please share this podcast so we can raise more exposure to Michelle's case, which has gone unsolved for 19 years. Again, if you would like to keep up to date with the podcast, you can follow us on Twitter at uncover underscore pod or on Instagram at uncover true crime pod. That's everything I have for you today. Thank you so much for listening to the end. Thank you and have a good night.